Jarl Wartooth, with two swords, at Locktown Dog says, you ever look back at your day's Twitter posts and think there's something slightly off with your gray matter? Well, Jarl, only if you're the president of the United States. Hi, I'm Mayan Bialik, and this is Neuroscience Support. Alexandria Friesen, at Lexi Friesen, asks, at what point is a guy's frontal lobe fully developed? With many question marks, I want to use this knowledge as a gauge for when to give them a 17th chance and when to just throw the whole man away. Well, Lexi, frontal lobe should be developed in the late teens or early 20s if we're lucky, but sometimes by behavior, it just seems like it doesn't happen. I'd say if you're looking at a 17th chance, throw the whole man away. Or woman. D at Bellicosavan says, one thing that does bug me is this thing called cat breast syndrome. Like how do you actually know that the things around you haven't been replaced with an exact copy? Well, D, that's the point. Cat breast syndrome is a delusional psychiatric disorder where you actually believe that someone close to you is a replica and not the actual person. It's a very, very, very specific, unusual existential crisis of a disorder. And the fact is, you really don't know. Robin Richardson at Robin underscore R underscore R says, can Stendhal syndrome kill you? Well, Stendhal syndrome is a syndrome of both physical and emotional features, typically when seeing something of tremendous beauty. You have a rapid heartbeat, you can faint, you can have hallucinations. Robin, I don't think it can kill you, but it sounds like you might be in love. Enjoy. Truck Man's Ghost, at Truck Man's Ghost, says, is it possible to have Cotard syndrome, but like in a sexy, liberating way? Well, I'm gonna be as delicate as I can right now. Considering that this is a syndrome, which is a delusion that you are dead, or that your organs are liquefying or putrefying, I'm gonna go ahead and say no. Dr. Baumuk Kamdar at Kamdar underscore J asked, does knowing how and why a person behaves as he behaves, neuroscience, absolve the person of his actions and its subsequent consequences? Knowing how and why a person behaves is extremely important in understanding people's motivations but it absolutely does not absolve the person of actions and consequences. This is a really, really complicated legal issue, obviously. And I think as our understanding of human motivation and behavior expands, and as our knowledge of the brain and the mind expands, we're understanding more about some principles of compassion. Um, and I think that's been sorely lacking from the justice system, especially when it deals with people with mental health challenges or psychological or psychiatric conditions. The entity, comma, Jim, at blood flu, says, neuroscience friends, hey, how and why does the outbreath activate the parasympathetic nervous system? What is the mechanism and what should I read to understand it? Let's say that you don't need to know the mechanism unless you really, really want to, in which case I would honestly just Google parasympathetic nervous system and you can read all about it. But doctors like Dr. Sarno have talked a lot about um, de-escalating the agitation of the nervous system by lowering blood pressure. And one of the ways that we do this is with deep exhalation. There's a whole vagal system of your nervous system and the vagal system is responsible for really acting as, as the downer for your system. It involves the brain, it involves organs in your body, which all contribute to heart rate and, and uh, blood constriction, things like that. And those are the things that literally increase your blood pressure and make you feel that sense of agitation. So the exhalation stimulates the vagal nerve and that whole system, which helps your entire body literally slow down. There's also amazing meditation books about breath. And I would look to those to see the practical applications of helping your parasympathetic nervous system calm you down. Snicket McGee at Snicket Chan asks, is it possible to have chronic fatigue syndrome as a child? A lot of people question 
the, the actual diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. It is a collection of symptoms that get grouped into this diagnosis. And I'm not saying I don't believe in it. Absolutely, you can have chronic fatigue syndrome and all of those symptoms as a child, 100%. But also from a clinical perspective, you'd really want to look to what are the other factors in a child's environment that are leading to those symptoms. There is a huge psychological environmental component to all of these kinds of diagnoses, whether in adults or children. So I would actually look to address those first. Akron at Akron says, is there a mask that is more trigeminal neuralgia friendly? <laughs> I ask that every day. I'm trying to not put myself in pain each time I need to buy something. This is a great question. The trigeminal nerve is a very special nerve. It's one of your cranial nerves. And some people are extremely sensitive to irritation of that nerve. That is a thing. If anyone's ever had a migraine and has felt your teeth and your nose and your eye hurt, that's your trigeminal nerve getting really, really mad. I'm gonna go ahead and say, if that mask is out there, you can probably find it. I do not want you to be in pain every time you need to buy something or just go back to the old school bandana and make sure it comes all the way up to your nose. Mikkel at Crackle Chulo wants to know, guys, any recommendations for someone who has a sleep disorder? Doesn't matter if it's medicine. Well, I'm sure that you've searched other things that people do for sleep disorders besides medicine. And I would recommend those things both as a neuroscientist and as a human. Meditating before bed, I know some people are like, eh, that's so stupid. Any meditation program that does guided sleep meditations can be really, really helpful in going to sleep. If you have trouble staying asleep, meditation will also help in lowering your general kind of need for your brain to process actively at night. People do like melatonin, which you can take in safe supplements, and that mimics your body's natural sleepy hormones. A warm bath before bed is good because it actually heats you up so your body compensates and lowers your body temperature, which is what your body likes to go to sleep. So for those of you who like to get cozy under the covers, there's a reason for that. Also just general shout out for psychotherapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. A lot of those of us with sleep disorders um, have underlying things going on in our heads and our lives that can interfere with sleep. Also having a regular bedtime does help and a regular wake up time also helps. Good luck. Two fan at Mortaza underscore MQ says, is social media responsible for sleep disorder in most of the cases? I'm going to say no, but I haven't done the research. As a scientist, I'm going to go ahead and remind you that most of means more than 50%. Social media can do two things that can interfere with your sleep. One is it can keep you up later at night than you should be. It can make you have too much interaction with light before sleep because you're checking it before sleep. The most important thing that social media probably interferes with sleep through is filling your head with all sorts of information, a lot of which is probably not necessarily useful. The human brain has not changed in the last 10 years versus hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. We do need a lot of downtime and we do need boredom and social media has kind of removed our ability to have downtime and boredom, which are good for the brain and also do contribute to healthier sleep. Notorious OMG with a heart at Secret Diary Mom, what's the best time of day to switch from uppers to downers asking for my neurotransmitters? Well, Secret Diary Mom, your neurotransmitters pretty much know what to do without you adding anything to them. So I would say, Stop drinking caffeine after noon or one or two o'clock. That's an upper. And in terms of downers, I hope you mean nap time and meditation. Thanks, Secret Diary Mom. Iman at why not Iman underscore says, being tired all the time is such a mystery. Is it anemia, vitamin D deficiency, chronic fatigue syndrome, depression, insomnia? Is it just the crushing weight of being alive in a capitalistic society? Someone cure me, please. Well, I'm gonna go for crushing weight of being alive in a capitalistic society, but there are tests for anemia, for vitamin D deficiency. We do have a way to assess if you have chronic fatigue syndrome. Depression and insomnia, those are likely because of the crushing weight of being alive in a capitalistic society. So I'm tired all the time too. Phoebe Luckhurst at Phoebe Luckhurst 
says, can anyone please help with some insights into what games like Candy Crush do to your brain? All my neuroscientists are rejecting my advances. Well, Phoebe, this neuroscientist isn't rejecting your advances. I'll be happy to tell you. They're filling your brain with random pieces of candy that you have to, to I don't know, make rows of so they disappear. Candy Crush is wonderful for distraction. It is mindless fun. It's like candy. It doesn't really have any nutritional value, but it sure feels good when you put it in your mouth and eat it. In all seriousness, Candy Crush is asking your brain to do a lot of non-challenging computation while also distracting you from um, anything that's going on in reality, which means like any good drug or bad drug, you should use it for good and not evil. Good luck. Ching. Ale Salgado at Tiempo ASM says, should we use drugs to boost brain power? What do you think? Neuroscientists have different posture. Well, this neuroscientist has terrible posture. I'm just kidding. I'm actually a little bit on the fence here about boosting brain power with drugs. I think that what worries me about the discussions I've heard surrounding boosting brain power is a need to increase productivity beyond what feels human and humane. And I think that's something that concerns me. I don't think that brain power should be seen as something that can and should be treated as if we're a computer that needs to be supercharged. I think that there's a human interest level of understanding that the power that we have is what our brains were developed to have. And on the other hand, we have the ability to create drugs that can enhance that. And are there safe ways to do that? I'm not sure. Right now, it seems that it's being abused, but I think more will be revealed. Rhiannon at V4 Nuisance says, wait, I have a question. Okay, I'm waiting. I'm not trying to offend anyone, I'm just curious. Are things like schizophrenia, OCD, dissociative identity disorder, etc., considered neurodivergent? I've seen people define it as your brain being wired differently. So does that apply to those as well? Just wanted to know, thank you, smile face. Neurodivergent typically refers to people whose brains learn differently. And it's something we typically use kind of in academic circles to talk about modalities for learning and helping people um, achieve to the level that their brain is happy to achieve at. Things like schizophrenia, OCD, dissociative identity disorder, those are examples of the brain not necessarily being wired differently, but we do know that there are, there are genetic differences. For some forms of schizophrenia and OCD, DID is usually, there's likely a genetic component and also environmental impacts, but these are things that are um, more about the way you are genetically coded rather than the notion of being wired differently. So I like to think of neurodivergent as wiring in terms of learning and those other things in terms of diagnostic psychiatric criteria. Ravi at Shriya Ravi 12 says, does TikTok stimulate Alice in Wonderland syndrome? I couldn't possibly be the only person who feels like they're suckered into a bizarre time value warp when I'm consuming this media form. I'm impressed that you're calling TikTok a media form. I'm digging that. Alice in Wonderland syndrome is, is typically the syndrome where you feel that a body part of yours is of a different size. It's a, a visual and kind of sensory perceptual syndrome. The notion of being kind of down the rabbit hole and losing time is maybe a looser definition of Alice in Wonderland syndrome. And I would say you're absolutely correct. Things like TikTok and those kinds of media forms do absolutely suck time away and much like video gaming you can pass a lot of time without knowing the time has passed so you are absolutely right tiktok makes you feel like time goes away dr koch at red stocking lady says head hurting from caffeine withdrawal or growing dendrites caffeine withdrawal will absolutely make your head hurt it'll also make you really really grumpy Growing dendrites, which are the, uh, the extensions of neuronal processes that communicate with other neurons, is not typically something we feel, but if you're quitting caffeine, your dendrites might be really, really grateful, since caffeine's not so great for your brain, especially in large quantities. So it could be your dendrites saying like, you've abused us for too long, we're gonna make your head hurt as we stretch ourselves out. Sieva Kaczynski 
at Sieva Kaczynski, says what increases the possibilities of multiple sclerosis? Does smoking marijuana break down axons? Multiple sclerosis is a, a genetic disorder which does cause the demyelination of axons. Axons are the things that connect the cell body to the parts of the cell that communicate with other cells. And they are lined, axons are lined with essentially fat. That's why we need to eat fat and cholesterol. But in multiple sclerosis, this fat starts to break down and the axons can't communicate information rapidly because fat is a great insulator for moving information quickly, especially of an electrical quality. Smoking marijuana does a lot of things. It cannot break down axons. It also does not demyelinate axons, which is what happens in multiple sclerosis. So multiple sclerosis is a genetic disease and smoking marijuana does a lot of things to interfere with brain function, but breaking down axons is not one. Faithy at FPXOX says, am I now realizing the reality of life because I just turned 25 and my frontal lobe just finished developing? Or is it the four months of quarantine? Your frontal lobe does finish developing somewhere in your early 20s, but that's not really what makes you understand the reality of life. You won't really understand the reality of life until you can't leave your house and you have to wear a mask anytime you do, and you're stuck with yourself and all of your problems and issues. So I'm gonna vote for quarantine. Happy birthday. Be Wildebeest at Alex underscore Alex. Is a nerve cell the long thin one with a huge head with loads of dendrites? There are lots of different kinds of neurons and they look a lot of different ways, but the classical nerve cell, the classical neuron is a long thin one with a huge head. That's where the nucleus is with the DNA and loads of dendrites. Those are the things that communicate with other cells. So yep, you got it. That's a nerve cell. Hull House at Medium Titty Goth says, why don't people talk about how having ADD and ADHD can apparently cut around eight years off a person's lifespan and being untreated, undiagnosed until adulthood can apparently cut an estimated 13 years off your lifespan because your neurodevelopment is so stunted during childhood. To be honest with you, I have not heard these statistics and this is something I would like to look into. I think it's an important point though that a lot of times in science we have correlations that may not be causations. So with these kind of facts, and this is kind of the, the dangerous thing about the internet, we can hear things and kind of run with them, but it really takes looking at this kind of study and, and what factors did they control for? What are the other comorbid factors we were dealing with in, in understanding who this sample size is? So I'm gonna look into this and thank you for bringing it to my attention. These are very, very startling statistics and I'm very curious. So scientists are always learning too. Eve at Eve Dehan says, does anyone else who gets sleep paralysis a lot know what triggers it? Won't have it for like six months and then have it for like five days in a row. Sleep paralysis is pretty much what it sounds like. It's usually when you're in a half sleep state and your body cannot move. You often have cognition, meaning you want to move. You are not asleep. It's not a dream. It's somewhere in between. And there have been studies done showing the, the brain waves are literally kind of caught in between. It can be very, very terrifying, very scary. I would look into what's going on in terms of maybe speaking to a therapist or, or a cognitive behavioral therapist to see if there's a correlation. There may be food triggers, environmental triggers, and sometimes a cognitive behavioral therapist can give you words and cues that can help you come out of that state quicker. And good luck. Wani at mbambara underscore Wani says, you know how you can reboot devices? Yes, Wani, I know. Do you think it's possible to do that to the human brain? If not, why? Well, this is gonna be an answer you don't like. There is something called electroconvulsive therapy treatment and many view as very inhumane and I would tend to agree with all due respect. Mm -hmm. It is essentially a, a reboot for the human brain and it involves passing large amounts of electrical current into the brain. It is a really, really dramatic treatment, usually for untreatable suicidal depression that is unresponsive to many, many other modalities. I have known people who have had this done. It is very significant, should not be taken lightly. In general, I will say therapy is a wonderful way to reparent your brain and to, to reboot emotionally. It is not the kind of reboot I think you were asking about, 
That one guy at that one guy 21,000 says, how do people with epilepsy handle police lights? Epilepsy is a, a neurological condition that does involve seizures. Those seizures can be brought on by strobe lights, flickering lights, probably been in a, a movie theater or a show at an amusement park where they say, if you have epilepsy, this show involves strobe lights. Police lights are not, you know, vibrating at that frequency is kind of the, the hippy dippy way to say it. Police lights do not trigger epilepsy to my knowledge. It's usually a, a more specific and high frequency kind of flickering that's gonna trigger that. Robert at BLK Rocket says, are mammals wired for empathy, grief, compassion, loneliness? Well, Robert, you and I are mammals, and I'm pretty sure you know that we are wired for empathy. It's one of the things that helps us stay bonded as mammals and perpetuate the species, if you think about it. We are wired for processing grief, yes. Primates, in particular, are wired for grief. We absolutely see cases of really most mammals being wired for compassion and for altruistic behavior. As for us being wired for loneliness, loneliness is an extension of the need to connect and perpetuate togetherness. Even non-mammals are wired for that, but yes, mammals are wired for all of those things and more. I really enjoyed answering this smattering of neuroscience support questions. I think that the format of social media makes us able to communicate in ways about things we're curious about. And for someone who studied the brain for 12 years of my life and continues to be a science educator, it's beautiful to talk about these things. It's beautiful to see really the holes in people's knowledge and also what they're curious about and what's bothering them. It really underscores for me the need for us to have more access for mental health. And I think also people are interested in the brain because it's fun and amazing. And that's the reason I studied it. So super happy to talk about that with anyone who wants to talk about it. Thank you so much everybody for your questions. Stay curious and maybe we'll do this again sometime. Ciao.